Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the day four of the European Sustainable Energy Week 2022, which means that it's also our last day of this policy conference. These past three days have been going by so fast because we had some really intense discussions and really active participation from each and every one of you. But worry not, because today we still have in store two of the big topics of, this, of Europe's energy transition, so we will still have plenty of inspiring, insightful, and full of knowledge policy sessions today. The format will be slightly different today. So up until now, we had uh, two separate blocks every half a day dedicated to a specific topic. Today, we will have uh, the two keynote speeches for the two thematic blocks taking place today. First on the consumers and the fair transition and the second one on decarbonization. And then throughout the rest of the day, we will have the different policy sessions. As always, 12 policy sessions in total. In, uh, divided in three uh, in four slots with three parallel sessions each. You will be able to see in the schedule. Um, we have a special guest today for the closing remarks because Executive Vice President Margrethe Vestager will be joining us here on stage today together with Director General Dieter Jürgensen. The policy sessions uh, from the parallel sessions will all be run in English. Just so that you know, so just since today, is the last day. Our exhibitors are available in the energy fair here in person, but you will still be able to connect with them online tomorrow. And the networking tool remains available for you to meet and connect with other participants. As I said, for the past couple of days, we've had a lot of participation from each one of you, and today is going to be no different. Many of today's sessions, including the closing ceremony today, will be using Slido, so have your phone, your device ready for that as we will have multiple parallel sessions today, just for you to keep in mind that when you're in Slido, make sure you select the right session from the drop-down menu at the top right of the screen, so we make sure that the right moderator gets the right questions. Now, let's start with the first one of the thematic blocks that we'll be presenting today. The EU is committed to ensuring that delivering a more sustainable decarbonized energy system leaves no one behind. So today, in this thematic block of the consumers and the fair transitions, we will be introduce, uh, introducing how the EU wants to ensure a just transition that is fair for consumers, how we are tackling energy poverty, how we are bringing a gender and youth perspective into climate and energy policies. And for this, we have the honor to have a special guest with us in this uh, keynote uh, speech, and I'm delighted to be introducing Susana Solis Perez. She's a member of the European Parliament from Spain for the Renew Europe Group. Thank you very much, Susana Solis, for being with us. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, it's an honor to, for me to be here. Dear Deputy Director General, uh, Mr. Baldwin, uh, dear speakers and guests, dear all, um, as I said, I'm very happy to be here today with, of, with all of you. As a member of the European Parliament, both at the Committee of for Industry and Energy and the Committee for Environment, it's a great honor to be addressing so many of you uh, in the context of this year's European Sustainable Energy Week. This week has always been a major event across Europe. After all, it is our biggest annual event dedicated to renewables and energy efficiency. This year, however, after the brutal and illegal aggression of Russia towards Ukraine and the resulting humanitarian catastrophe and energy crisis, its role as a forum for building a secure energy future is more relevant than ever before. Rising energy costs for consumers is becoming a problem for many people across our continent, particularly in low-income households, but also for the first time amongst European middle-income households that struggle to pay their energy bills. Today's session dedicated to consumers and a fair energy transition will provide us with food for thought on the main challenges and priorities that we, as European policymakers, but also as European society as a whole, need to confront. Now, more urgently than ever, because our energy transition is no longer a faraway target, but an immediate priority, an immediate priority accelerated by our war on, our, on European soil. And given this difficult context and the challenging times ahead, what are the priorities for the European Parliament? Today, I would like to highlight five key issues or five messages we, 
we would like to, th to give you. The first one is that we need to take measures, but they need to be temporary. Because we know that gas and electricity prices are at high record because of the Russian invasion. Energy prices are expected to remain high because Russia is weaponizing the gas exports in Europe. We have woken them up. We have no longer naive about it. We are aware that the dramatic increase in electricity prices is putting pressure on households, small and medium-sized enterprises, and industry as to a painful degree. More than 50 million households in the EU already, already experience energy poverty, and this situation could become worse in the coming months. However, Acer's assessment on the EU electricity market design showed that the market does function under normal circumstances, and that is why I believe emergency interventions are absolutely necessary, yes, no doubt, but this interventionism has to be temporary. I believe that exceptional circumstances require exceptional measures, but we should also agree on exactly that, that they are indeed exceptional. Intervention in the energy market must be temporary, targeted, and we need to ensure that fundamental market principles and the integrity of the market, of the single market, are preserved. My second point is that we need to protect the most vulnerable, because the current situation is critical. So it is only natural that we, as European policymakers, agree to put in place a European energy shield that will protect our citizens, especially the lowest income households and SMEs. In this sense, any measures like the proposed temporary solidarity contribution by the fossil fuel sector on the windfall profits should go to consumers and businesses. The energy transition needs to be fair, and we cannot afford to leave our people behind. This is why we should follow, for example, the initiatives taken during COVID and establish exceptional additional flexibility in cohesion funds in order to enable member states and regions to provide a response to the unprecedented energy crisis. We should be able to mobilize non-utilized non -utilized funds of the 1420 period and even some resources allocated to the 21-27 period as we did during the pandemic to support SMEs and families. And I also think that we could, we could simplify procedures to use these remnants uh, easily. I also believe that the Commission should prolong and adapt the SURE mechanism to support short-time work schemes for workers that have been temporarily laid off because of the increase of energy prices. It is only right that extraordinary benefits should be redirected to families in difficulty. Europe needs to be there for those in difficulty. Europe has to show families its added value. We need a social shield for vulnerable households. And we need to provide useful solutions because at least more and more obvious, it is going to be a very difficult winter for many Europeans. We need to make the social dimension and the protection of European consumers a priority during this energy crisis. This is something that must be in the heart of the energy debate. We cannot afford to detach ourselves from the day-to-day -day problems of families and SMEs who cannot afford to pay five times what they were paying a year and ago uh, before. My third point is renewables. Renewables are the solution. And we show at that time that we protect our citizens, invest massively in innovation and renewables. The European Parliament is already working in this direction. Just a few weeks ago, we agreed on a more ambitious renewable energy directive with a renewable target of 45% in line with Repower EU. Not only that, but we are currently amending the directive in the context of Repower to accelerate permitting procedures by cutting red tape, setting benchmarks, and promoting deployment of renewables in priority areas. Renewables, divers diversification of supply, and innovation are definitely the right way to go if we want to strengthen the EU's energy autonomy in the long term. 
Renewables are great at providing locally generated sustainable sources of energy, and we need to support their development and deployment without any doubt. While intermittency is an issue, however, and while renewable generation capacity cannot cover our demand, I think that the responsible thing to do is to also support transition role for dispatchable low emission generation sources that contribute to, to diversification and our security of supply that will benefit our consumers and our industry. My fourth point is about empowering citizens. Uh, as I have just mentioned, our climate targets will require a massive increase in the production and consumption of renewable energy sources and implementing energy efficiency measures both at system level and through behavioral change. In this sense, empowering citizens to take action and promote renewable energy con uh, communities can have extremely positive consequences. It leads to improved energy security, lower energy bills, active local participation, and boost local investments. I am confident that if we lift the barriers, renewable energy communities can flourish. And my last point is that we need to reduce our energy demand. A key element to maintain energy prices stable is to reduce our consumption. The cheapest energy is the one that we do not need to produce. While we need to work on advancing energy efficiency, the Commission has already put forward proposals to reduce energy consumption during the peak hours. We think that member states would be wise to match energy efficiency and saving targets with the ones set by the European Parliament in this position on the Energy Efficiency Directive. In this sense, I believe it is only coherent for member states and the Commission to step up with information campaigns to better inform citizens and businesses, in particular SMEs, on how to reduce their energy demand and improve energy efficiency. Maybe incentives for companies and households that are able to reduce their consumptions beyond the reduction targets could be a way forward. And finally, as you can see, the challenges ahead uh, are many and the times complicated and uncertain. I am confident, however, that united and with a clear direction, we can stand strong and deliver. We need to deliver for our climate, but above all, for our citizens and consumers, so they can keep the heating on during the winter. But also because we cannot allow for an authoritarian war criminal to blackmail Europe in this way. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the, the day, and thanks for the invitation. Thank you very much, Susanna Solis, for being with us. I think it's been very interesting to understand a little bit what's next to come, I think, in the next few sessions, also connecting it with some of the topics we've already been seeing uh, in the past days at the Sustainable Energy Week, right? Repower EU, energy efficiency, renewables, and also understanding well the role that the European Parliament is doing to protect consumers and ensure a fair transition. So thank you very much for being with us. Now, it's time also to present the second one of our thematic blocks of today, which is going to be decarbonization. All sectors need to play their part in the energy transition and in reducing emissions. And especially throughout the afternoon, we will have sessions on how we are decarbonizing several sectors. And we're ranging from energy intensive industries to heating and what's the role that several EU instruments can play in delivering that. So to give us a taste of what's to come uh, in the next few hours, I'm delighted to introduce, again, he's joining us again on stage, Mr. Matthew, Matthew Baldwin. He's the Deputy Director General for Mobility and Transport at the European Commission's Directorate General for Energy. So thank you very much, Matthew, for being with us again today. Thank you very much. Great to be here again. I can't get enough of the European Sustainable Energy Week. I'm back for a second dose. Um, and I'm, it's great to be back, actually, to take your temperature. We've been seeing some fantastic feedback on, on social media. And if you haven't dipped your toe into that particular pond, hashtag EUSEW2022, join that debate. 
Um, and let us hear, give us your feedback, not just about the issues, but about the conference and how it looked to you. Thank you so much, Mrs. Solis Perez, I can't see you now, there you are, uh, for an inspirational speech, which I think gives us a great kickoff for the rest of the morning. And as has been explained so well, I'm to introduce the thematic block, what a glamorous term for our work on uh, uh, renewables and decarbonizing this afternoon. Um, we often say, let's step back, that the main objectives of what we're trying to achieve in EU energy policy is to ensure a secure, affordable, and a sustainable energy supply across the whole of the EU. Sounds great, doesn't it? That's what we should be going for. Let's take a frank look at what people say about that sometimes. Sometimes I hear critics say that we've taken for granted uh, the uh, secure and affordable objectives. We haven't done enough in those areas. We've done too much on the sustainable side. Others again say, with the energy crisis, with the greater focus on both the price spike and on simply this existential question, are we going to have enough gas to heat our homes this winter? Will we be able to eat as well as heat? Um, that we've, we've gone too far. Um, we've, we've dumped the uh, the EU Green Deal. I could not disagree more profoundly with these two criticisms. The three objectives of, uh, of a sound energy policy, security, affordability, and sustainability, fit together more now, today, than they ever have in the past. They fit extremely closely together. And that's why we came up with this thing, which you've heard a lot about, I hope you've heard a lot about this week, our Repower EU plan our blueprint for reducing our dependence on the imports of Russian fossil fuels, of course trying to address the concerns about the security of energy supply, of course trying to address the issues around the price that we pay for it. But underlying all of it, the green thread which runs through Repower EU is that the key step is to deliver on the European Green Deal, for many of the reasons so eloquently put by, by Mrs. Solis Perez. So it shouldn't come therefore as a surprise Two of the three pillars in what we've set out in uh, the Repower EU plan are aimed directly at not just continuing but accelerating us on our path towards a decarbonized economy more quickly. Our proposals in May uh, are not afraid to look again at targets. Targets for energy efficiency. We've uh, raised the proposed binding target to apply across the European Union from nine to 13% for renewables in our energy mix by 2030 to get to a 45% share of renewables above and beyond the existing target of 40%. Beyond the figures we tabled just last year in the Fit for, five, fit for 55 proposals. So let's agree these targets soon. And if we can get agreement to these targets just in the coming months, we can indeed see an acceleration not just before the end of the decade, but an acceleration this year towards our green goals. But aside from the big headline targets, which are very important, um, all the declarations and the commitments that we make in the, uh, in the overall global climate change contact mean nothing unless we can really focus on and deliver on those key objectives. But if you add to those the qualitative aspects set out in the uh, Repower EU plan, and again, we can talk about those this afternoon, and I hope you've heard about them during the course of this week, rooftop solar, heat pumps, hydrogen, biomethane. If we can deliver on these issues, we will also, in fact, be delivering not just on sustainability, but on security as well. So why is this session we're having this afternoon so important? And why do I want everyone online and here in the, in the room to, to dig in and focus on this? Let's, again, step back from the big perspectives. Obviously, the environmental perspective is the first and most uh, visible one in terms of lower emissions, uh, in terms of cleaner air, in terms of a slowdown in global warming. But I really urge everyone to think about the linkages between those issues. If we just take one example, if we can reduce the use of cars in our city, particularly the, what they like to call the classic cars, the carbon, <laughs> carbon driven cars, we can at one fell swoop reduce some of the major sources of external costs in our system. The costs that come, of course, from climate emissions, the terrible costs that come from 
dirty air for our children uh, as we move around the cities, the cost of congestion in our streets, the cost of deaths from road crashes. If you put the external costs from just these four categories together, and this is, of course, beyond cities, you can count one trillion euros a year, around one trillion euros a year. And most of these costs in our terrible economic jargon are not internalized, paid for. And guess what? The cost is born somewhere, and it's born on the rest of society. So just as one example of something we can do, if we can pull things together, we can make a huge difference. And that, of course, leads me to the second reason we should be doing all of this, the economic perspective. If we can, in big picture terms, make the necessary investments in energy efficiency, in renewables, we bring jobs and growth. Not just a mantra, but something we have to deliver. At current levels, renewables are considerably cheaper than gas. Now's the moment for those investments to be triggered because those investments will break even earlier. Talking to friends and colleagues, those investments that people are making in solar panels are paying back in six years, not in eight years, not in 10 years. It's getting faster and, and, and quicker. And we build a snowball of progress towards these goals. You've heard from the social perspective how important these things are. If we can invest in energy efficiency, and renovation in particular, we can address energy poverty. We can help vulnerable consumers to reduce their energy consumption, to reduce their bills, to have more things to spend money on to increase their quality of life. And then last but not least, of course, from the geopolitical perspective, we humble people in DGNO, we don't like to get mixed up in geopolitics, but we got badly mixed up in geopolitics by Vladimir Putin, didn't we just? And that's the fact we have to face, that he has weaponized the energy markets. He has weaponized gas prices. And an EU economy that runs on renewables that saves energy in a, in a coherent and careful way is going to be one that's much less reliant on imports from unreliable places like Russia. Security of supply from a local energy grid is much more likely to be safe than sitting back and crossing your fingers and hoping that today Gazprom will not turn the tap. And here I fully agree with you, Mrs. Soli Perez, that Europe has such a crucial way to role to play here. It's striking how much Europe has, has become the focus of this energy crisis. Um, Europe has to be ready for what comes this winter, and Europe will be ready for what comes this winter. A couple more remarks, if I may. Um, this is all fine words, I hope, but how do we finance it? How do we pay for these grand ambitions? Well, the simple story is that we need a combination of public and private funds. Of course, the vast majority of this should be driven from the private sector, triggered by price and, and relative price changes. But we are not afraid to put our money where our mouth is very often uh, speaking these words. Public funds are vital for priming the, the markets, pointing the way, uh, paying for infrastructure often, and, and signaling um, uh, the messages that need to go to investors. So in Repower AU, we are hoping to deliver an additional 210 billion euros above and beyond what was coming through Fit for 55 by 2027. If we can do that, it's money in the bank. We will save 80 billion euros, roughly speaking, uh, from, uh, from uh, gas uh, imports, 12 billion euros from oil imports, 2 billion euros in coal imports. These is, this is money well spent looking ahead. And so, again, it's no coincidence that we want to focus on uh, re renovation and on renewables as two of the key themes in the recovery and resilience facility set up with the Commission to help the economic recovery after the pandemic and aimed to get a major booster through the Repower Initiative. Um, and I'm very much hoping to see progress on that front, both in the Council and the Parliament in the, in the coming weeks. Projects of common interest, funding cross-border connections, bringing uh, one of the Europe's fundamental roles in how we can help deliver in different ways. Uh, through the Connecting Europe facility. Um, we've seen, for example, a lot of investment in recent years um, driven by PCIs in the crucial area of liquefied natural gas, a great way of improving our flexibility in the system. This has been vital in helping us find short and medium-term solutions to Russian gas. Just this week, we saw the Baltic pipe open, supplying Poland with gas coming out of Norway. And last but not least, I urge you to think when we talk about decarbonization, decarbonization this afternoon about multi-level governance. What a horrific phrase that is. The role of different levels can play in bringing this forward. Um, 
yes, at the global level, um, we need to make the pledges, we need to drive things forward, we want an ambitious outcome of COP27. Yes, at the European level, that's absolutely essential that we can move things forward. Yes, again, at the national level. But let's not forget the role that regions and cities could play. In fact, uh, so often I think of what's happening in the COP, the, 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 the declarations, the ambitions are set at the global level and they're going to be delivered and implemented at the local level. And one of the things I was most excited to be working before I came to DG Enna was the project to have 100 climate neutral and smart cities across the EU by 2030. A hugely ambitious goal, but I have a, f a funny feeling that that's going to become the new norm for what we're trying to achieve in decarbonisation. Cities have the chance to set the path, to drive ahead, to deliver on the progress that others can then follow. Cities have huge inherent advantages in terms of their population density, the short commuting times, but most of all the political will to succeed. So let's hitch our cart a bit to the ambitions of mayors across Europe and beyond, by the way, and see what can be delivered. Last but not least, and I now stop, I'm sorry if I'm going slightly over, I just want to underline the need for international cooperation and partnership in all of this. And that's the last and most, perhaps the most long-lasting theme you'll see in Repower EU, to find not just alternative suppliers from reliable suppliers, but lasting partnerships. And that's what we're trying to achieve with the energy platform. That's my new day job. We're trying to deliver on those partnerships um, working with member states, thinking of ways about how we can buy our gas jointly to change the way um, uh, we can deliver together. In summary, ladies and gentlemen, and I'll cut my remarks short because I can feel the nervousness to, uh, to get me off, I really want to underline what I said at the start, that there is no dichotomy between these three objectives that we are trying to achieve in any sound energy policy. Security, affordability and sustainability. Let's not be frightened. Let's push ahead with that sustainable stuff. It helps fundamentally with the other objectives. Let's go at it. Have a great day. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Matthew. Ooh. <laughs> Sorry about that. It, it had to happen at some point. Uh, thank you very much, Matthew. I think it's been fascinating to see how all the different all the different dots, all the different topics we've been seeing uh, in the past uh, past few days are all connected, and how we all uh, play a role. And we are in this together to achieve our our energy and our environmental objectives. So thank you very much for having been with us this morning. Well, I will just echo also the, the words that uh, Matthew said at the very beginning, which is that we would love to hear your thoughts from this very last day at the European Sustainable Energy Week. So make sure to tweet using the hashtag EUSAW 2022. Would be great to hear what has made you think, what have you agreed with, what have you disagreed with, what are your best memories and highlights from this conference. We are starting the first round of policy sessions uh, right now, so make sure to choose the session you would like to attend. And uh, see you around. Enjoy this day.